morning, everybody. It's a pleasure for me to be here and to talk about an interesting, at least I find it quite interesting topic. I have my uh, conflicts here. I'm uh, chairing the IRB, but I was never involved in any of the uh, in approval of any of the studies that I will be talking about. Well, we will be talking about opioids and opioid receptors. And we all know that opioid receptors are abundantly present in the central nervous system. Um, there are three types, in fact, there are four types, but um, um, the main goal of our treatment of our patients with opioids is uh, the production of analgesia. It's very quite simple. That's why we give them opioids. We give it postoperatively to induce analgesia, perioperatively to reduce um, hemodynamic responses related to stress, related to nociception. But opioids have side effects. And um, one of the side effects is potentially lethal, and that's respiratory depression, and that's my topic of research, and that's what I will be talking to you about. Of course, there are many, many other side effects. I will not be discussing those, but I will be discussing respiratory depression. Well, how, how do we know that somebody's respiratory depressed? Well, here is a slide that shows you what happens if you treat, uh, if you overdose your patient postoperatively with morphine. Um, there are several stages of respiratory um, instability and respiratory depression. It always starts with respiratory um, instability or irregular breathing. If you have a patient that starts to breathe irregular after a large dose of an opioid, he will at one point um, be apneic following a period that we call cyclic breathing that you can see here. There are periods of breathing that stop and uh, at one point, breathing stops uh, completely. Well, this is an acute pain patient, post-operative pain patient, has been overdosed. Um, and, but also in chronic pain patients, the um, observation of respiratory instability is extremely important. We recently did a study that we published in anesthesiology in which we looked at um, oxycodone in opioid-naive patients, uh, especially we looked at uh, elderly patients, and we looked at the interaction between alcohol, the use of alcohol, and oxycodone-induced respiratory depression. This is a very relevant topic, especially to my country. It, for me, initially, we tried to recruit both opioid and alcohol-naive subjects. We were, it was for us impossible to do. We found lots of opioid-naive patients, both young and elderly, but I could not find one alcohol-naive. Really, I'm not kidding. So this is really relevant because we treat our uh, elderly and younger patients with opioids. And this was a relatively simple study. We gave them the combination of oral oxycodone with an intravenous infusion of alcohol mimicking 0.5 or 1 per meal of alcohol, let's say 3 to 5 to 5 to 6 um, beers per hour. And we measured the, um, the, 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 the occurrence of apneic events. And what we saw was that, especially in the elderly, there was an exponential rise in apneic events already at a low dose of, um, of alcohol. But you're laughing about the, the consumption of, of, of alcohol. But this is quite regular. These people, in general, um, and I'm not only talking about students, but in the general population, the use of alcohol is quite widespread and quite normal. So this is a study that we did. And we spoke a little bit this morning about the opioid epidemic in the US. We're a very different country from the US. We're a very small country. We only have 17, 17 million people. Very, very small country. But we also have an opioid epidemic. But it's very, very different in nature than the opioid epidemic in the US. If you look at this, this is the increase in opioid consumption in the general population in the Netherlands. These are 18 plus people, so these are all adults, and you can see that 8% of the population consumes an opioid, it's almost 1.5 million. And that is a lot for a small country like ours. And you can also see the, the extreme increase over the last couple of years. There are several differences with the op opioid epidemic that occurs currently in the US. First of all, few people die of opioids in my country, very, very few. Um, and also addiction, it is a problem, I have to say, but it's not as much as a problem as it is here. And last year, um, there were 1,000 people admitted for uh, issues like addiction. Doesn't mean that addiction is not an issue, it is an issue, but we only admitted 1,000 people. That's very interesting, we can 
talk about the differences between the countries, I think that we treat a different socioeconomic population. Compared to the US, we treat middle class people. I will leave in the middle what, 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 what kind of people are treated in, in the US with opioids. If we look at the strong opioids that people take in my country, it's predominantly oxycodone. That's a very popular drug. And that is a little bit surprising because this is a generic drug. There's little pressure from um, uh, manufacturers to promote or to give, to treat the oxycodone. There has been a little bit of a different approach in the Netherlands towards treating pain. Pain is considered something that nobody should uh, endure, and we all should treat our patients uh, as, with, with as potent as possible medication. What's also surprising to me is that there's a large number of patients that being treated with patches, like uh, buprenorphine patches, fentanyl patches, and just a, f a small population um, is treated with morphine. So th these are people that use patients that use um, chronic opioids. Um, I did an, an, a study, and these are people that use opioids for at least eight months. And only 40% of these people have um, cancer-related uh, pain. So this is predominantly non-cancer-related. Most of these patients have low back pain. But I will not be talking about the opioid epidemic. I will be talking about respiratory control. And I give you here a very simple schematic of the brain stem um, and of the different um, areas of that brain stem involved in respiratory control. And what is important to realize, these different areas, they all contain uh, mu opioid receptors. Most importantly, there are two areas that, are, that have a high density of opioid receptors. This, this area and the prebutsigar area, they are very, uh, very prone to um, our um, exogenous opioids. And because of activation at these areas, people start to hypoventilate. Um, chemo sensitive areas are present. Um, so th these areas are sensitive to CO2. I will show you some CO2 responses, so this is important. Um, but what is most important is that we have specific neuromodulators in the brainstem. And these neuromodulators are very important in sustaining breathing. In fact, they activate breathing. So we have two important groups. They're the serotonin receptors and there are the AMPAR receptors. And I will be discussing especially the AMPAR receptors today um, because I will be focusing on uh, human studies. Um, the next speaker, um, Joe Cotton, will be discussing animal studies, I assume. And there are just no human studies that show that serotonin agonists uh, produce um, relief of opioid-induced respiratory depression. They are with AMPAR receptors. You can see these two um, systems work, these two Neuromodulates work at central sites within the brainstem. But we also have a peripheral receptor. That's the peripheral chemoreceptor. The peripheral chemoreceptor is at the bifurcation of the common carotid artery. Um, it's a small organ. Uh, we have two of them. Um, I'm especially interested in them, not only because of um, the control of breathing. In the Netherlands, we have a large population of patients that have tumors of those organs, and we take the organ out. So I'm also very interested in what the effect is of um, removal of the carotid body. The carotid body is involved in respiratory control. Um, they contain oxygen-sensitive cells. I will come back to that later in the next slide. So they are the O2 sensors of our body. There are many more O2 sensors. They're a little bit involved in CO2 control. They measure glucose, they measure temperature, and they also are important in blood pressure control because there is a new treatment being developed currently in which the carotid body is being destructed for patients with therapy-resistant hypertension. I'm involved in that as well. A very interesting project. It's done with HIFU. HIFU is high-intensity focal ultrasound. Um, catheter is placed in the femoral uh, vein it's all directed to the jugular vein. It then goes towards the carotid body and there destructs the carotid body and blood pressure is lowered. But let's go back to oxygen sensing in this interesting organ. The organ has two cell types. There is the type one cell, it's this one, it's the oxygen sensing cell. And there's the type two cell, which is a cystenticular cell, cystenticular cell or a glia cell. And this is the important one. Oxygen sensing is extremely complex, and to be honest, um, there are ver various theories and we do not really know how it works. Um, I want to keep it extremely simple today. 
um, and we'll focus on the potassium channel. Um, there are potassium channels here, and they're O2 sensitive, and when the cell becomes hypoxic, the potassium channel closes. There's an um, increase of calcium into the cell and the release of various neurotransmitters. I show here ATP and acetylcholine. They are stimulatory. They stimulate breathing, but there are other um, uh, neurotransmitters, for instance, dopamine that is released, and dopamine is an inhibitory um, neuromodulator. So if you give low-dose dopamine to your patient, uh, I hope you don't do that anymore. We don't do it in our hospital, but then you shut down this system and there's no hypoxic response. So this is something to memorize now for some uh, minutes. Um, how do we know that the opioid receptor and, and opioids induce um, respiratory depression? You know, that, that's a, not an easy um, question to answer. Well, we know that um, only after um, the development of so-called mu opioid receptor knockout mice. This is a study that I did together with um, a French group, and we looked at the efficacy of, um, of, of morphine effect. We gave these uh, mice morphine, and these were so-called wild-type mice, normal mice, and mice that lack the mu opioid receptor. You can see the difference in, in respiration at low and high CO2 levels. Um, if you have no opioid receptors, it's like injecting um, saline. It's like injecting uh, normal water. Nothing happens. If you have opioids on board, your breathing will slow down. Initially, there will be an increase in tidal volume at one point breathing becomes irregular and you will stop breathing. So I've shown you so far two sets of receptors and neuromodulators involved in ventilatory control. On one hand, we have the opioids and their subsystems um, that produce respiratory depression. On the other hand, I've shown you that there are several uh, neuromodulators that stimulate breathing, that activate breathing. So there is a balance in our, in our brain stem and crotus bodies involved as well. On the one hand, because we have endogenous opioids, they, it's unlikely that they will ever produce respiratory depression because the system is excited continuously by AMPA receptors, serotonin receptors, and in the carotid bodies, there are also the, carotid, the potassium channels that, that modulate our, our breathing. So in case of opioid-induced respiratory depression, we could do several things. We could give naloxone, but you know naloxone not only antagonizes um, the respiratory depression, but it also counteracts the energy, the wanted effects, the, uh, the, the analgesia. So we have to look elsewhere. And we've been involved in various uh, projects in which we look at stimulants that stimulate breathing without affecting analgesia. And that was really important to us, so we're not really interested. We're interested in naloxone, of course. We've done multiple studies there, but for this project, we focus on um, stimulants that bypass the opioid system. And I can give you some examples. And um, in the um, left side, there are these AMPA receptors, these agonists, I have to say, these, these substances that act uh, to stimulate breathing at central sites within the central nervous system, especially at the brainstem level. Then we have these stimulants that produce ventilatory stimulation at peripheral levels. And there's a, an, another group. I will not be discussing that group. It's an interesting group. The CO2, of course, is a very potent uh, respiratory stimulant. And in Britain, for example, they used to have little canisters with CO2 on their anesthesia machines at the end of the case. To give a little bit of CO2, patient will breathe. We had it, too, in our hospital. When I started out many, many, many years ago, we had that, too. But we don't have it anymore because we believe the patient has to sustain breathing on its own. And CO2 you know, can only help them in the, um, in the OR. Then they go to the recovery room, the PACU. Well, then there are other drugs um, that I will not discuss, um, like atropine, caffeine, aminophylline. They've all been shown to stimulate breathing. Caffeine is still used, I think, in neonates, um, uh, also in my, uh, my hospital. The first drug I would like to discuss is ketamine. We've heard a little bit about ketamine. You have to realize that we've, I'm now in my hospital for over 30 years, and most of my patients after, during abdominal surgery, get a low-dose ketamine infusion. They go to the ward with low-dose ketamine infusion, which is sustained up until they leave the hospital. We never see any problems. Why do we give it? For two reasons. Most importantly, to reduce opioid consumption. And secondly, because it has a, an effect on breathing. 
this isn't, you know, I, was, I did not realize up until recently that it actually stimulates breathing, but the variability in the breathing, breathing was, was less. So they had a more regular breathing. Ketamine is not an easy drug to understand. It has multiple um, metabolites. It has norketamine. In our hands, norketamine is um, anti-analgesic. Not really sure what that means, but realize that. And there is hydroxynorketamine, which is the metabolite of norketamine. They act at different receptors, ketamine and hydroxynorketamine. Ketamine acts predominantly at the NMDA receptor. There's a recent publication from Nature that shows that, you know, that ketamine is a very potent antidepressant. Um, it's used worldwide, actually, also in my hospital, to treat therapy-resistant um, depression. And um, these people um, from the US that published this in, in Nature, they show uh, that it's not ketamine itself, but the hydroxynorketamine metabolite that produces, um, and I'm looking at Peter, and he will, uh, because he knows more, much more about depression than I do. But this is what I read and understood from that paper. So we started this project because we use so much ketamine. Um, virtually in all large abdominal surgery, we use it. And the first study that I did was I just gave ketamine in increasing dose. And then I have to say, you guys use racemic ketamine. We don't have racemic ketamine. Well, we have it, but we have to import it, especially when you do research. We only have S-ketamine. S-ketamine is twice as potent as racemic ketamine. We, we tested it recently. I, I gave the two uh, compounds to a similar group of, of volunteers, and we actually measured potency difference, and potency difference is indeed a factor of two, both for the anesthetic effect as the analgesic effect as the side effect profile. So we gave 40 milligrams of S-ketamine over one hour stepwise, to a group of volunteers, and we measured their ventilation. We both measured minute ventilation on a breath-to-breath -breath basis. I show you here the one-minute averages. And we measured end tidal CO2. And you see a little bit. If, if anything, there's a little bit of respiratory stimulation, especially at the high end. Neither ventilation nor uh, end tidal CO2 on its own was significantly different from baseline levels. But I, you know, I believe that this is a respiratory stimulant, at least a little bit. Now the question is, what happens if you give an opioid? Is it as mildly stimulant as you see here, or is it truly a respiratory stimulant in the sense that it can overcome opioid-induced respiratory depression, something that you actually want? So we continued our experiments with repeating the study, but now under isohypercapnic levels. So we increased ventilation to 20 liters per minute because we really wanted to see an effect. Then we gave remifentanil, and we wanted a de decrease in ventilation of about 40 to 50 percent. We succeeded in that. In or oh, sorry, in orange, the remifentanil, and you can see that this is a placebo-controlled, completely blinded study. That with placebo, nothing happens, but you can see dose-related increase in ventilation uh, with ketamine, which is quite interesting. Apparently, when there is no defect in the system, when there's no opioid on board, ketamine. Like I said, stabilizes ventilation at most, nothing more. It doesn't produce actual ventilatory stimulation. Only when you have a defect in the system that you produce um, respiratory stimulation. Well, we did some modeling. Um, so what we observed was that not everybody responded, by the way, to ketamine. Just 75% of the population. Um, so we had actual ketamine responders. This is a placebo, um, a ketamine non-responder, sorry. You can see really nothing happens in this volunteer. Could be, by the way, a dosing issue. Maybe this person needs more ketamine. Could be a um, genetic issue. Maybe it's not the ketamine, but one of its metabolites, and this guy does not um, metabolize ketamine so well. We had placebo uh, responders and non-responders. But if you see, the placebo effect is just a, a fraction of the ketamine effect. So going back to what I said, how is it possible that ketamine stimulates breathing in some subject and in some not? It's not an easy thing to answer. If you believe it's the uh, AMPA receptor that's involved, it could well be that due to some differences in, um, in expression of genes involved in the metabolism of ketamine that are differences in subjects. But 25% in a very um, homogeneous um, population that we had, it's doubtful. I think it's a dosing effect, and I still believe that we're dealing here with an NMDA um, respiratory effect. And why do I believe that? Well, there's some evidence from a population 
of um, patients or from a disease called the RET syndrome, R-E-T-T -T syndrome, these um, individuals uh, have a MECP2 mutation causing mental retardation and respiratory instability. And these children, they die at a very young age of five years. However, if you treat these, um, these children with ketamine, and these, by the way, are animal studies published in the Journal of Biological Psychiatry, but if you treat these children with ketamine, you see some improvement in respiratory function. So it might well be that we're dealing here with an NMDA effect. Effect. On the other hand, it could also be a, an AMPA effect. And then if you look at another drug, tianeptine, you might know it. It's an uh, antidepressant. Um, I don't think they use it here in the US. They use it in, in, in France and in Germany. We don't use it in my country either. It's a very atypical antidepressant. It reduces the amount of serotonin in the brain, but it increases the the turnover of serotonin at the receptor, but most importantly, it um, is an AMPA uh, agonist. And in that sense, people have been trying to overcome morphine-induced respiratory depression in animals, and they indeed, they succeeded in doing so. So this is an animal experiment. Um, this is before treatment of tianeptine. Um, then at this point, they started to treat the animals with tianeptine, either a low or a high dose, two or 10 milligrams per kilogram. And you can see that it stimulates breathing. At this point, morphine was given, and only the saline-treated animals produced uh, have had respiratory depression. So other also human studies point towards the AMPA receptors. For instance, this is data from a, a German group that looked at the AMPA kines. So these are uh, compounds that actually um, um, act at the AMPA receptor, specifically the AMPA receptor. This is a compound called CX717. It's being um, developed for treatment of um, schizophrenia and ADHD. And this is a study um, which they did, and they show that if you have a baseline CO2 response, so this is about CO2 sensitivity, you can see after the um, administration of alfentanil, the response is severely depressed, but together with the Ampakine, the response is restored, but not completely. It restores only 50%. Important, but not completely. Okay, now we've been talking now about central sites. Now let's go back to the peripheral sites. And remember the carotid body. This is, by the way, a heat map of the carotid body. You see it's not always located exactly at the bifurcation. It can be all the way up here. But these are type 1 cells with a potassium channel that's extremely important, as it is the O2 sensor, at least. Let's consider it the O2 sensor for now. Um, what drugs do we have that uh, mimic the effect of hypoxia in blocking the potassium channel at the carotid bodies? Well, we have three drugs, actually. We have Elmetrine. You might know it. We have Doxaprem. I assume most of you know it. In my whole career, I only used it once when I was an, uh, a young resident. And after that, all of a sudden, it had disappeared. I'm not really sure why. I've never seen it again. And there is an experimental compound called GAL-021. Um, Elmetrine was used for some time, especially in France. They took it off the market. And the EMA, the European um, FDA, uh, withdrew its license in 2013, so just four years ago, because of the occurrence of peripheral neuropathy. Um, it has, uh, induces uh, some form of large and small fiber neuropathy, and that's uh, irreversible, so it's not, not a good drug to use. Then there's doxapram, and I will talk about it just a tiny bit. It's a task potassium channel, a background potassium channel a blocker. It has side effects, side effects, severe side effects. It's an analeptic drug, produces panic attacks. It increases the sympathetic system, so you get hypertension, increase in cardiac output, etc. And then there is GAL-021, a very interesting drug, mimics the effects of hypoxia at the carotid bodies. Um, no side effects. We've used it at a, up until very high dosages. For instance, it does not produce cardiac output increases, but the company went bankrupt. And as far as I know, I have to say, there is no further development of this drug. Uh, I will show you the results of a couple, three studies that we did with Doxapram and GAL. This is a study that we did with Doxapram, and we treated volunteers with Doxapram. On the right top side, you see the plasma concentration, so we gave an initial bolus continuous infusion, then we increased the dose quite high up, bolus continuous infusion, then we stopped. And this is a relatively high dose. This is the dose 
um, that was still acceptable to our volunteers. Higher doses caused severe panic attacks, um, sweating, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, as you can see, what happens is that, especially um, with um, doxaprem, cardiac output increases. Because of the increase of the cardiac output, um, and this was done with and with uh, with um, with an opioid on board, L-fentanyl. And as you can see, the increase in the cardiac output reduced the plasma concentration of the cardiac output, causing reduction of pain relief. And we also saw, two minutes, okay. We also saw a decrease in, um, in res respiratory depression. It was tiny, however. And we believe that the effect, like I said before, is due to an effect of the increase in cardiac output. It, it has an effect on the clearance of the alfentanil. So doxaprem really works. The effects were small, however, I think you need to dose much higher, but it causes more side effects. But you need to realize that part of the effects are due to a central or to a cardiac output related effect. Then quickly to the gel compound. Gel compound is an experimental drug which mimics the effects of hypoxia at the carotid body. This is ventilation. This is placebo during um, L-fentanyl administration produces respiratory depression, the gal increases respiration. And um, I have little time, so I will skip these two modeling slides, but I would like to go to this slide. And this is an important slide, because if you activate respiration at peripheral sites, while the respiratory depression occurs at central sites, you need to realize that ceiling might occur because you might not be able to overcome with the limited amount of respiratory stimulation that you get from peripheral stimulation, you might not overcome the central um, barrage or central depression of respiration. And indeed, indeed, that was the case. We showed that if you have just 50% respiratory depression from your opioid, the drug acts as a, a very potent respiratory stimulant. However, if you have high dose respiratory depression, you cannot overcome this barrage, this, this, this very severe central effect. Well, in conclusion, I've shown you that opioid-induced respiratory depression is a serious side effect. I think that too few people study respiratory depression, really, I believe that. I showed you that prevention is possible. Um, on one hand, you can stimulate um, the drug, prefer preferably with central acting drugs like ampicines or ketamine, possibly hydroxynarketamine. There is development of new drugs. These are the drugs that I work with. Um, for instance, this is a very interesting new drug. Works at mu kappa and delta receptors. Um, but still, um, maybe um, we should at one point consider not using opioids, especially perioperatively and postoperatively, I have to say, and aim at, at other drugs like what we do now, ketamine. Thank you very much. Okay, our second speaker for this session is Dr. Joe Cot Joseph Cotton. Um, Joe was educated at MIT, received both MD and PhD degrees from the University of Iowa, and then uh, interned for a year at BU here in Boston and went to University of California, San Francisco for his anesthesia residency as well as a research fellowship. Uh, Joe then moved to MGH where he has continued as a successful physician scientist. Um, I'm a neighbor of Joe's in the lab, so I've seen him as a collaborator as well and can tell you that uh, he's remarkably uh, skilled and has uh, basically any problem you bring to Joe, Joe can find a solution. You, he uses electrophysiology and mo molecules, cells, and whole animals. He designs and builds custom equipment, data acquisition interfaces, closed-loop delivery systems to study drug effects. Um, in animals, uh, as well as other endpoints. Um, and these talents have been crucial for a lot of collaborative research in our unit. Um, Joe's research 
focus is on molecular pathophysiology and cystic fibrosis in the past, more recently background potassium channels that act as chemosensors involved in the control of breathing, including anesthesia sensitive channels. Uh, his research is supported by multiple grants. So please welcome Joe. He's going to talk about developing drugs to treat respiratory depression. Thanks, Stu, and thanks, Michael, for the, for the invitation. Um, so we'll be talking about some um, compounds or drugs for um, treating respiratory depression. Uh, no financial disclosures. And this work is currently funded by the NIH and uh, the Department of Anesthesia at MGH. So my talk will have two parts. Um, first part, I'll talk about potassium channel antagonists as uh, breathing stimulants and agents to reverse opioid-induced respiratory depression. And then the second part, I'll talk about some, some more recent studies um, developing or looking at TRH as a breathing stimulant. Okay. So just as a, as a reminder, there's, there's three families of potassium channels, voltage-dependent, the inward rectified, and then the tandem pore channel. And this is the family that, that I work on that I'm interested in. And they're called tandem pore because there's two pore lining amino acid signature sequences in tandem on each subunit, so here and here. And it's believed that two of these subunits come together to form a functional channel. So you can have homodimers or heterodimeric channels. And there, there's 15 human subunits that have been identified. And they, in general, mediate a background potassium conductance. So they, they contribute to the resting membrane potential of cells or neurons, and they control excitability. And I became initially interested in them because several of them are activated by volatile anesthetics, so they may be a, a target for inhaled anesthetics. This, this is a dendrogram showing the, the 15 human members of this family. The, the first one identified was TWIC1, and so we work on task one and task three, and, and, and task stands for TWIC-related acid-sensitive K-channel. So these are acidic pH-inhibited potassium channels, and they're inhibited in the, in the physiologic range, pKa of 7.4 and 6.8. And the crystal structures of four of these have now been solved. So TWIC, TRAC, and TRAC1 and 2. And so that was a huge advance in this field. As uh, Dr. Dahan uh, introduced, the crowded body is, is the peripheral chemosensing organ. It's important in regulation of breathing. It senses oxygen, pH, glucose, and even insulin in the arterial blood. Um, it's not to be confused with the carotid sinus, which has baroreceptor function, which protects you from blood pressure variability. And it mediates 100% of the hypoxic ventilatory drive, as well as it contributes to the, the cardiovascular, the sympathetic response to hypoxia. And so down here is just the, sort of the stereotypical ventilatory response to hypoxia. So with decreasing PaO2, there's this curvilinear response, so you, you breathe more. And there's a linear relationship with oxygen saturation. But it's known now that task one and task three tandem pore channels contribute, they're the, they're the predominant background potassium conductance or permeability in the chemosensing cells of the carotid body, the type one gloma cells. And uh, Keith Buckler and colleagues, he's at the University of Oxford, he was the first guy to show this. Um, he identified an, an oxygen inhibited acidic pH inhibited and anesthetic activated potassium conductance in these cells. And these are current clamp records from this study. So on the y-axis is the resting membrane potential of the gloma cells. And you can see with the application of hypoxia, these cells become depolarized and start to fire action potentials. And that's true for you know, hyper, hypercapnia or increased carbon dioxide as well as acidic pH. And then um, Dong Hee Kim, he's at the Medical College of Chicago. He used some single channel analysis to show that task one, task three, and the task one, three heterodimer are the predominant hypoxia sensitive cells, uh, sensitive channels in the carotid body cells. 
so, uh, you know, again, the way the carotid body senses uh, hypoxia and acidic pH is inhibition of potassium channels. And they're very likely tandem poor task one and task three channels, but they may also be due to BK or voltage dependent channels. But how hypoxia translates into potassium channel inhibition is still not clear to me. It ultimately leads to depolarization, calcium influx, and then neurotransmitter release. So again, doxapram, it's, a, it's a, a ventilatory stimulant that acts at least in part through stimulation of the crowded body. Uh, it was introduced in the 1960s and may have a role, and had a clinical role in um, reversing CNS and ventilatory depression after anesthesia. It's also been used to treat COPD patients and infants with apnea of prematurity. It's a very low potency drug um, in, the low, in the micromolar range. But this led us to the hypothesis then that if, if inhibition of potassium channels is an important step in carotid body chemosensing, then this drug may act by inhibiting uh, these potassium channels when expressed in a heterologous system. And this was work that was published um, in 2006 and that was conducted in, in Spencer Yost's lab back at UCSF. And to test this hypothesis, we injected xenoposoocytes, frog eggs, with CRNA from task one task three or the task one three heterodimer. And we studied their function using the two electric voltage clamp technique. And so in, it's shown in this figure are our current records from the, patch clamp, or from the voltage clamp where the y-axis is current in microamps, x-axis is time in minutes. And you can see with the application of 150, 30 micromolar doxapram, there's a reversible inhibition of these channels. And then, then all these channels again are inhibited by acidic pH. So the concentration um, response analysis yields an IC50 of about 400 nanomolar for task one, and then nine and 37 micromolar for the task three and the heterodimer. So then in the subsequent years, um, um, high throughput techniques combined with chemical optimization has identified multiple very potent task potassium channel and, and antagonists. Merck published on one in 2012 with IC50s of 35 and 300 nanomolar. Remember, doxapram was in the micromolar range. Uh, Sanofi Aventis has a compound, A1899, 70 and 7 nanomolar. <laughs> and then a KU Johns Hopkins NIH funded screen identified several compounds, and one of them, ML365, had 990 and 16 nanomolar. And there's, there's actually even more compounds that have been identified. So we had a chemist make these for us. This is the Merck compound and the Sanofi. And then doxapram you can buy from veterinary suppliers. It's fairly expensive, but it's still available. And we tested their effects on, on TAS potassium channel function. Um, we, we, it, we transfected an FRT monolayer uh, cell line with TAS3 and studied the potassium channel flux through the monolayer. It's, it's just the way I study these channels. Um, and, and measured its response to these different drugs. And shown in this figure are current records from the Susan Chamber system. This is the zero current level. This is the task current flowing through the monolayer. So you're looking at that potassium current. And you can see with the application of this drug, there's a stepwise decrease in, in, the, in the channel. And so from the concentration analysis, we calculated or estimated an IC50 of 10 nanomolar for, for the Merck compound. 36 nanomolar for the A1899, and then doxapram was you know, three orders of magnitude less potent uh, in the 16 micromolar. So, you know, doxapram stimulates breathing. We just wondered if these drugs were also breathing stimulants. And so to test this, we injected them into a tail vein of a spontaneously breathing anesthetized rat. So these are rats that are breathing isoflurane at one mac, 1.5%. And um, we measured their breathing by plethysmography, so we put them in a, a gas-tight chamber, basically. And you can see that this figure is a normalized breathing response, so on the y-axis. And you can see that there's a stable breathing pattern. And then when you inject the Merck compound, five milligrams per kilogram, you get a really nice, robust increase in minute ventilation. These rats are breathing like crazy when you give them this drug. It's, it's impressive. And that's largely due to an increase in minute ventilation, but also their respiratory rate. The other drug, A1899 and doxapram, are not really as potent or, or, and or effective as breathing stimulants. And then here's the, the vehicle control. And this is just the raw signal from the plethysmography chamber before and after drug administration. 
We also did arterial blood gas analysis on some of these animals. And um, so these, these are rats um, that were also instrumented with a femoral artery catheter. And you can see that, that PKTHPP induces a nice alkalosis at 15 and 30 minutes after giving the drug. And that's due largely to a marked decrease in the PaCO2. So these rats have a, have a raging respiratory alkalosis. A1899, less striking, and doxepram even less so. so. And then here's the vehicle control. And this down here is just an anti, this is an intubated anesthetized rat. And you can see, look at the end tidal CO2, and you can see a marked decrease as the, as, a, as the animal blows off its CO2. And one bolus lasts for about an hour. So because these are such excellent breathing stimulants, you want to know if they would be able to reverse opioid-induced respiratory depression, which would be an obvious clinical use for them. And so to test that, we injected it into intubated rats and it, that had received morphine. And in these studies, we use a pneumotac to study the rat's breathing. Um, so shown in this figure is a pneumotac signal from an intubated rat. Again, it's breathing spontaneously. It's under isoflurane anesthesia. And when you give five milligrams per kilogram of morphine over five minutes, you fairly predictably get about a 50% decrease in minute ventilation. And you can see when we administer this drug, we reverse some of that ventilatory depression. And this is the signal from a control animal. And then we drew blood gases at baseline in 15 and 30 minutes after giving the breathing stimulant. And what we found is that the drug partially reverses opioid-induced respiratory depression. So in terms of ventilation, it went from 41 in the absence of breathing stimulant down to only 19% depression. And at 30 minutes, it was 48 to 19. The effects on, it decreased the, the effects on PaCO2, and it also improved oxygenation. So there was less hypoxia in the drug and the animals that received the breathing stimulant. So just in summary for part one, I showed you that task channels in the carotid body may contribute to regulation of breathing. Doxepram a breathing stimulant and a carotid body activator inhibits task channels in vitro. PKTHPP and A1899 are potent and selective task inhibitors, and they cause marked stimulation of breathing. And then PKTHPP at least partially reverses opioid-induced respiratory depression in rats. So I'll next talk about TRH as a breathing stimulant. And this is, an, is a water-soluble endogenous peptide or hormone, um, and its structure is shown over here. It's a tripeptide, and it's, it's, N, it's N terminus and it's C terminus are modified. So its carboxylate is amidated here, and the glutamate residue swings around and forms an amide bond to form a pyroglutamyl. So this is actually the C terminus right here. Um, and its endogenous uh, receptor is a TRH G, G protein coupled receptor which is a GQ-coupled or an excitatory receptor. So it's, in, in, and I, we became interested in it because it, it, it it's, um, inhibits task channels in the brain. Okay. And this is a really heavily studied area with, with, uh, with the TRH compound. There's over 11,000 references in PubMed that, that reference TRH. But it was first identified in the hypothalamus of millions of life, livestock animals, and it stimulates TSH and prolactin solution, uh, secretion in the anterior pituitary. So it has an important uh, endocrine role. But it's also present throughout the CNS, the, the spinal cord, it's in the gut, it's in the pancreas, so it has probably additional roles. But it's an FDA-approved co uh, compound, but no, it's, not really, it's not marketed in the United States anymore. And it was used primarily by endocrinologists in the evaluation of hypothyroidism, but apparently they don't use it anymore. But as a therapeutic agent, it had a lot of promise because of its neurostimulatory as well as its neurotropic effects. So when you inject it into an animal, it increases breathing, increases blood pressure, increases locomotion. It, uh, it, it decreases anesthesia sleep time by about 50%, which is how I got interested in it. It also um, diminishes some of the hypothermia. And it also may have some analgesic or anti-nociceptive properties. So it's really an interesting compound. Um, it's been examined as a potential therapy for ALS, spinal cerebellar degeneration, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, as a, a rapid for treatment, a rapid treatment of uh, depression, uh, epilepsy, spinal cord shock, um, shock, spinal cord injury, cancer fatigue. And so there's a lot of interest from drug companies with this, with this particular agent. Um, but we know that it's a breathing stimulant. And this was a paper published in 1989 by Schaefer et al. And what they did was they injected two milligrams per kilogram of IV TRH into rodents. And they studied uh, conscious animals as well as anesthetized animals. 
And what they saw was that there was a, there was a really a, a significant increase in the breathing rate, which lasted about 40 minutes. Right? They also saw a slight increase in blood pressure and a slight increase in the heart rate. So this, this is the figure from that paper where the y-axis is the breathing rate, normalized breathing rate. And um, this is time in minutes. And you can see with the application of, uh, in, with the injection of TRH, there's a nice stimulation in breathing and it goes down. The hashtag here, these are just the 95% um, the confidence window for the, the conscious animal. So the breathing effects were a little bit more striking in the anesthetized animal. TRH is also a breathing stimulant in humans. This was a paper published in 1991 by Nick and colleagues. 40, 41 male and, 45 male and female healthy volunteers. They give them boluses of either 200 or 400 micrograms uh, intravenously. And the drug increased their ventilation primarily by an increase in tidal volume, and, but it also increased their res responsivity to CO2. There's a slight increase in heart, heart rate. The side effects were nausea, I think about 50%. Dizziness, palpitations, and an increased sense of vigilance. And this is just the flow signal from one of the, their patients from a pneumatac. This is the TRH application here, and you can see a nice increase in tidal volume here. And this is their minute ventilation. Again, about a transient 40% increase in minute ventilation and a slight increase in the heart rate. So we wanted to know, I mean, it's clearly a breathing stimulant, so we wanted to know how good is it at reversing opioid-induced respiratory depression. So to test this, we, um, we took rats and we anesthetized them with isoflurane, intubated them, instrumented them with a tail vein and a femoral artery catheter, and then measured their baseline breathing under 1.5% isoflurane anesthesia, drew a baseline gas, injected morphine, five milligrams per kilogram over 55 minutes, which gives you about a 50% decrease in ventilation. We then administered TRH, one milligram per kilogram, followed by a continuous infusion, and then did a second and a third <coughs> blood gas. What we found is this drug works really well for reversing opioid-induced respiratory depression. So shown in this figure on the left is the normalized breathing response. This is the morphine-only treated rat, the TRH-only treated rat, and then the morphine plus TRH. And you can see with morphine treatment, there's about a 50% decrease in minute ventilation, which is, minute ventilation is the black bars. And then um, rate is the blue dots, and red is the tidal volume. But you can see here's that sort of irregular breathing that Dr. Dahan talked about. With TRH, there's a, there's a slight increase in minute ventilation in the TRH-only animal. Okay. And then in the morphine-treated animal, there's really a, a marked increase in their respiratory rate. They, they, they really take off breathing. And that's, and, but that's also accompanied by a, a decrease in their tidal volume. So it's a very rapid, shallow pattern of breathing. Right? But if you look at the arterial blood gas analysis, you can see that morphine induces a, a decrease in, in pH at 15 and 30 minutes, but that's partially reversed by the TRH. The carbon dioxide, the increase, is also partially decreased, but it doesn't really do much for the oxygenation, and I think that has to do with the, the much smaller tidal volumes. They may promote, you know, atelectasis or interpulmonary shunting, something. And then the animal treated with TRH only has just a mild respiratory alkalosis. But we want to know how good is this drug. And so we gave these rats a massive dose of morphine. So we gave them a lethal dose. So instead of five milligrams per kilogram, we gave them five milligrams per kilogram per minute, and we drove them into apnea. And rats, their oxygen consumption is about 10 times that of a human. So they don't tolerate apnea at all. They die within a minute if you don't, if you don't get them breathing. Uh, so, and what we found is that it, it, it worked. So four out of the four TRH treated rats lived, but three out of the three saline control animals all, all died. So again, here's the normalized breathing response. You start the morphine infusion here, boom, they go apneic. We gave them a two milligram per kilogram bolus of, of TRH, and it, it very nicely restored their breathing, very reliably. But again, it was this sort of rapid, shallow pattern of breathing. And then at the end here, we reversed it with Narcan at, at 30 minutes. And you can see there's this, you know, there's this, um, surge current at the end. So, so one of the problems with TRH as a therapeutic agent is that it has a very crummy bioavailability. It has a short serum half-life of only four minutes, and it's estimated that less than a percent of uh, systemically administered TRH actually makes it into the brain. And the other, the other problem for prolonged administration is its endocrine effects, the, you know, the thyroid effects and the prolactin effects. Um, but, but drug, drug companies have tried to address this, and then a, re, a review of the patent literature in 2011 found 24 different analogs of this you know, reported in the patent, patent literature. So there's a lot of different options, a lot of different flavors of TRH. 
Um, um, Tau Terellin is one of these agents. They have names like Monterellin, Azitarellin, Positarellin. So Tau Terellin is one of these agents, and it was um, developed by a Japanese drug company down here. And they, they state that it has the same sort of you know, therapeutic potential as TRH, you know, decreased anesthesia sleep time, et cetera. But it's 10 times stronger, eight times longer, and with 50-fold less endocrine effects. And it's, it's, it's approved in Japan it's also orally bioavailable, which is important to know. And it's improved in, 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 for human use for treatment of spir spinal cerebellar degeneration. That's a, that's a genetic disease that causes ataxia and loss of motor, motor function. But this is a long-acting you know, analog of TRH, and we wanted to know, does it reverse opioid-induced respiratory depression? And it worked actually better than TRH. It worked very nicely. So again, here's the rat that I already showed you, treated with TRH. But this is a tal treated rat. Here's the baseline breathing, morphine administration, and then a single bolus of one milligram per kilogram of taltorellin. Their breathing just shoots right up. They're breathing well over 200 times per minute. They're like a little machine going. Um, and their, their minute ventilation is, is more than corrected. Uh, but again, it's that rapid, shallow, it's that very efficient mode of breathing, lots of dead space ventilation probably. But if you look at the arterial blood gas analysis, um, down here, you can see that the carbon dioxide Increase in PaCO2 is completely reversed. The, um, the effects on oxygenation are reversed. Um, one thing that was a little bit concerning was there was a, there was a development of a slight uh, metabolic acidosis, a slight uh, increase in lactate. And, I, and I'm not sure what that's from. This drug is known to increase oxygen consumption significantly. Um, so inhalation is also a, a, is a, is an alternative method for delivering um, therapeutic proteins, from, I mainly just think of insulin as an example. And TRH is known to permeate rabbit trachea in vitro with no metabolism. So one of the, one of the theories is that this may be sort of a way around, and, and, and around for TRH's poor bioavailability. You can just give a big bolus of drug in the lung and then it'll slowly trickle into the system over time. And so we hypothesize that maybe inhaled or intratracheal TRH or taltorellin would reverse, reverse morphine-induced respiratory depression. And show, again, this is the rat that I showed you before, and, but these are um, rats that were treated with intratracheal TRH. So this was a single bolus of five milligrams per kilogram directly into the trachea, and it worked. It did very nicely in reversing opioid-induced respiratory depression. So in summary, I showed you TRH is an FDA-approved uh, endogenous tripeptide with a short half-life and poor av availability with neurostimulatory effects. Uh, intravenous TRH and Taltorellin provoke a marked tachypnea, this rapid shallow breathing, with morphine-treated animals responding much greater than untreated uh, animals. And this is a pattern similar to like with the ampokine drugs that are in development. It reverses even deep lethal levels of opioid-induced respiratory depression. And it has tracheobioavailability, implying that inhaled therapy may be a uh, potential. And I just thank my, my colleagues at UCSF and Mass General um, who worked on this project. I'm currently working with James and Anita on the TRH project. Thanks.